Welcome inside the first of two editions of the scores table this week. It's sectional times almost upon us. So this week we're uh, we're talking class 4A. That's the one that we're all three most familiar with. I'll have a lot more written words on 3A, 2A, and 1A. But we're going to do 4A. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to break it up in half across a couple episodes. So we'll start today with uh, 4A North. And I'm sure if you look right below, you'll find a link or something or the video itself to our 4A South breakdown. Before we jump into things, Josh, let's lead off with you because you uh, – You've been texting us about it like crazy. I'm excited to see it, but you have some rankings put together. Um, yeah, so I, uh, if, if you're familiar with Ken Palm uh, in, in in girls and uh, or in, in in men's and women's college basketball, uh, Ken Palm is like these uh, advanced stats they use to determine winning margins. And what he uses is uh, offensive efficiency, defensive efficiency, strength of schedule, and recent performance. So what I did is I came up with something similar um, for the high school 4A North and uh, just looking at different things. Now, obviously, I don't have access to everyone's huddle assist, you know, that has like all the advanced metrics. I don't have uh, not everyone is in uh, max preps either. So they're like there's a little like caveat there. It's really more for fun. And, and uh, you know, so. Um, what I did is I looked at uh, shooting, turnovers, extra possessions, so like steals, offensive rebounds, strength of schedule, and recent performance. So what I did is when I put my model together, like those were like the five things, shooting, turnovers, extra possessions, strength of schedule, and then recent performance. So what I'm going to do is I came up with like a, a, a top nine – list so so nine i guess is, is is where i'll start and then i'll have the the best team i guess uh, on my my rankings for the uh the four right north side uh, as my number one uh if you have problem with my rankings you can reach me at uh coach danny riego <laughs> at gmail.com okay. uh now remember there are some teams that are not on max prep so i did not include columbia city i didn't include homestead so we're going to start off with number nine okay number nine now remember the criteria shooting turnovers extra possessions strength of schedule recent performance number nine i have lake central okay on my on my uh my my ken palm we're calling it uh save palm for this uh segment uh number eight i have south bend washington Number seven, Northridge. Number six, uh, flying up the SAPOM uh, ratings is uh, is Warsaw. Okay, they are at number six. Uh, let's see, number five, I have Fishers. Okay, number four, HSC. Three, Zionsville. Two, Noblesville. And uh, number one on the SAPOM ratings uh, for 4A North is Fort Wayne Snyder. That's my ratings right now, based on those that criteria: shooting, turnovers, extra possessions, strength of schedule, and recent performance. So we will uh, see how it shakes out. I'm sure we'll talk more about these teams on this uh, on this episode. But uh, those are my rankings uh, as of right now. Danny, your thoughts? It's tough to qualify a list without Homestead and Columbia City, but I think the I think the first thing that jumps out at me, obviously, is the top with Snyder and Noblesville. I mean, when you have Noblesville above Zionsville, HSC, and Fishers with, I think it's nine losses, uh, that's interesting. So. I think it, it, it tells us if they take care of the ball and they shoot the ball well, rebound the ball for some extra possessions. Um, you know, maybe, yeah, no, maybe Noblesville we're... right now, out of those nine teams I gave you, they only turn the ball over nine times a game. Yeah. And uh, I, I had a coach tell me this a long time ago when, when talking about his players. If you go to class and don't turn it over, we're going to get along just fine. So that's why I have Noblesville at uh, number two and – they're seven and one since Christmas break. So uh, recent, uh, you know, recent performance is big. And uh, like I said, they also have the second strength of schedule. So that's why I had them probably a little bit higher than maybe most people uh, at this stage. 
Yeah, the strength of schedule is always built into the sectional eight teams, Noblesville, Zionsville, HSC, and Fishers. I mean, that stuff is always going to be built in because they play each other. Um, but Snyder, I mean, at number one surprises me. But the, the narrative has always been with South Bend, Washington, and Lake Central and some of these northern teams is do they play a schedule that's conducive enough to prepare them for a big state run? So South Bend, Washington at eight and Lake Central at nine, who is going to be a potential regional matchup and a Final Four uh, rematch from last year. I think it's interesting that they're so far down on the list too. Yeah, it's it's hard to like quantify this with like with analytics, but I think Jordan Poole is the one person in the north side in 4A that can get hers an unstructured play. And that's hard to like come up with some sort of like uh you know like stat for that. But I, I just feel like you know, when you play in these big time games. You know, you're going to be so well prepared, so well scouted that she's someone that can get her own and doesn't really need anything. And I think that's uh, really big for them. Absolutely. So the way that we're going to approach this breakdown today, we're going to go sectional by sectional, kind of touch a little bit deeper on some than others. Um, probably the best place to start is from the top of sectional one, the Lake Central Regional. Lake Central is the favorite in that group, but there's some some interesting teams there, as Danny alluded to on our live show last week with Munster, a team that could surprise some folks. But but Danny, I'll let you lead things off because I know you dug into into the group up there in the region, as it's known. Yeah. I think the most important thing in when looking at sectional one is Joe Huppenthal's coaching. I think he's an excellent coach, and he has five really good players in his starting lineup. Wimberly, Malosnik, uh, Krieger, Clayton, and Bishop. And they do, they run like a five out. They put the defense in a lot of dribble handoff action, on ball action. A lot of their base set is they'll set strong side ball screens. So he does a good job of taking these five guards and putting them in on ball action. So you have to guard them. But Huppenthal coached last year in the final four against Steve Reynolds in South Bend, Washington got a win there. But at the Hall of Fame Classic, I mean, this guy really scouts. Like, he's calling out sets. I think the most important thing is going to be his ability to put a good a good game plan in place. I really like his coaching. I think the biggest threat to Lake Central, you mentioned Grayson Gilliard at 26.2 points per game. Um, Hammond Central could provide a threat to them. They have India Hutchinson and Kennedy Blakely. Two kids that project to Division One talents. India Hutchinson particularly is a very, very strong left-handed kind of power point forward kind of player that is capable of going out and getting, honestly, 35 points. I think the key, if Lake Central were to get by Munster and get to a Saturday night matchup against Hammond Central, I think if Lake if if Lake Central can get the get the game at the higher pace, get a lot of possessions into it, I think that's going to be in their favor. But if Hammond, Hammond Central can slow the game down, play through Hutchinson, she does have the ability and she does have a, a counterpart and a partner in Kennedy Blakely that can go out and give Lake Central some problems with their size and their physicality. But there's two really good players that maybe we don't talk about down here. Indy Hutchinson's got to be one of the 10 best 2026s in the state. Really, really good player with multiple Division One offers right now. So, you know, as 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 much as as it's attractive to talk about a South Bend Washington versus Lake Central rematch in the regional, I think they I think we have to give Hammond Central a little bit of sound because they're going to hang with them um, if they can put a good game plan in place. Yeah, and the thing with uh, Hammond Central, so they've lost five games. Two of them have been to Indiana team, so they lost at Crown Point and Lake Central. Uh, they played Lake Central November eighteenth which we know every team is just kind of getting their wheels going. It was 62-45 Lake Central. Um, and then they went and played in a tournament over in Illinois. So their other three losses are to Illinois teams. And so I think that the they're in the bottom of that bracket, that the matchup is going to be Lake Central, Hammond Central, and I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah, for me, like I really like Lake Central to win this sectional, uh, sectional one. Um, obviously, they're at home as well. I think that's a big advantage. And obviously, they're very well coached. They've got a great top five. Uh, but the reason why I had them at number nine on my uh, ratings was they only shoot 30% from three. Um, and I, I'm i a little worried about their performance at the Hall of Fame Classic against Jennings County. Like, I, I don't know if there was girls that were out. I don't know, like, what happened. 
that was a pretty lopsided victory for, um, uh, you know, for uh, for Jennings County. So I like them to win sectional, but I do think that they're going to have a tough regional, uh, you know, with uh, South Bend, Washington, who will probably be their opponent. The thing about the Hall of Fame Classic was, was that, and I mean, I didn't even realize this going in, but they had traveled from Bedford, North Lawrence the week before, then had the holiday, and then turned right back around and driven all the way out to the Hall of Fame Classic. So, I mean, they were road weary. They played uh, Nobles, or they played Bedford, North Lawrence, and Lawrence Central on the same day, do the drive back all the way up to the region, come all the way back down to play that after the holiday, and they were just gassed. And I talked to Joe Hubbenthal, not to find the exact quote here, but paraphrasing, I kind of asked him, you know, would you do this again? And he said, probably not, because obviously you want to get your team tested, but he didn't realize how much of a grind the travel and all that was going to be. So that explains the loss to Jennings County. And when you see the way that they responded against Indian Creek, I think that there's more value in the way that they responded versus just kind of being gassed, road weary, and all that stuff in the first game. That's just how I look at it personally. But, but Josh, you might be right there. I think those are the big things, too, that we can look at with Joe Huppenthal really coaching kind of a, a – kind of a season there but if you look at the individual game adjustment too like you know i keep talking about hutchinson and blakely they're both left-handed for example right but if you it, it go back and watch that game wimberly really sits on blakely's left hand and they double very purposely the left hand shoulder of hutchinson when they double down like those are little things that i know joe helpenthal is talking about in practice and so i look at that as as a really well-coached basketball team with a lot of older guards that I think can circumvent a poor shooting performance, Josh. Oh, sorry, Josh. I thought you did Josh. Oh, no, 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 I agree. Like, like I said, it, it's, it's one game. It was one game. It was one performance, you know, uh, and it was back in December. Like I I'm sure like, you know, they've righted the ship. I mean, heck they've only, you know, they've only won lost once, I think. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure they will, they will, uh, you know, definitely be ready. So, what, Hank, do you want to – so that there's a, a potential regional matchup between South Bend, Washington, and Lake Central. Are we going to talk about the sectionals and then double back and to potential regional matchups? Or let's just, let's just hit the regional now since we're talking about Lake Central, the potential there, and if that goes chalk, they'll be facing South Bend, Washington, a rematch from last year's semi-state semifinals. Try saying that a few times fast from up, in, up at Huntington North. Um, a, a really intriguing matchup again because obviously South Bend Washington remains stacked. Lake Central, as we just talked about, is a really talented team. But Danny, since you brought it up, I'll let you take lead on, on what you you prognosticate there. I mean, just a huge emotional game, I think, for South Bend Washington. I think that the the talent that South Bend Washington had last year was insane. I mean, the, just insane. Division one talents, huge Division one talents coming off the bench. And Lake Central knocking them off. That was the score that reverberated through bleachers and phones and tweets and texts to be like, oh, my gosh, Lake Central has won. So this is a huge emotional game, I think, for them. I think the key to them is going to be controlling those emotions, making it a basketball game. All of those things are great kind of leading up to it and can motivate you and can can help focus you. But they can also have the adverse effect, too. They can also make you a little bit crazy. They can also, um, you know, mess with your emotions. They can speed you up. So. I think talent for talent. I think that will be an interesting rematch, but I do know that it that's one up in the South Bend, Washington area that they want because they want to avenge that loss last year because they felt like their season just ended too early. And when we get into the sectional, I think it's four, I guess it is. Um, and talk a little bit about South Bend, Washington. We talk about it, but their individual pieces, but that's a, that's a great opportunity to avenge a loss 365 days later if South Bend, Washington can get through sectional and, and see Lake Central on the other side. Yeah, the only thing that concerns me, I guess, about South Bend Washington is, you know, they don't really play a real tough schedule. It's 101st. And they're going to have two weeks off before they play their sectional games. And their sectional games, they should be able to get through pretty easily. I still think South Bend Washington will find a way to win this game against Lake Central at the regional. But if I if I was Coach Reynolds, the time off, the strength of schedule – that would definitely like be a concern. Like you just have to hope that, you know, you're, you're healthy and, and, and you're sharp because like you said, this is a very good Lake central team. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be interesting. That was probably one of the more, the most probably in, intriguing uh, regional matchup that we have coming up there. Cause the draw, 
just looking at it, the cursory glance at 4A, there weren't, there was, there were a few in there, but there were also some lopsided ones, and it was similar to the sectionals. You know, a lot of the sectionals, it's who do you draw in that regional that's going to dictate a lot of your chances for going to semi-state. Sounds counterintuitive, but this year, especially with how wide open things are, it felt especially important for a lot more teams than normal. Looking ahead to uh, sectional two, you have Valparaiso there. Um, Valpo's the favorite. Crown Point has the the history. And Chesterton is a team that can make some noise. Courtney, I'll let you start because I know we were talking a little bit about Lily Barnes and what she brings for Valpo coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I look at Valpo, um, their losses, of, they have a very strong schedule. So they've lost to Penn, Noblesville, Norwell, Lawrence North. Like those are quality losses. And those games weren't blowouts. Like they were close to four point games, a lot of those. And uh, they have one of the best 2026s in Lily Barnes. Uh, she's averaging 18 points a game. Six rebounds, six assists, and five steals. Like, that kid can hoop. Yeah, yeah. And I saw – I was there for their game against Olsen. It was. It was close. I was impressed. I wasn't sure what, what to expect there from Valparaiso, but they held their own after shaking off kind of the time change of playing what was essentially 9 or 10 in the morning for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they looked really good. And, and Lily Barnes has just gotten better. She's gotten healthier this season. As I wrote about before, she's been dealing – she had been dealing with a back injury, I think it was, over the summer. And then Becca Girk just getting her back and just what that brings to that team, especially after graduating um, some of the kids that they did last year. That's been a big a big boost for them, and they've, they've looked really good. And like you said, Courtney, they're not afraid to play anybody, which is really good to see. And for teams from up in that area, I mean, that just that changes the barometer a little bit and gives you a better idea of how legit that team is. And you look back to last year, I mean, Valparaiso almost did to, like, did to South Bend, Washington, what Lake Central did. I mean, they – they took them down to the wire in a game that surprised a lot of people, myself included. So it'll be interesting to see what they do now for an encore, but I, I don't expect uh, sectionals to be too much of a challenge for them. Dan? Yeah, I would be absolutely oh, surprised. I would be surprised if Valpo doesn't win that sectional. I would be absolutely surprised. In preparation to talk about sectional two, I came away really impressed with Lillian Barnes. I, I watched her earlier in the year against Lawrence North. And at the time, this was when Lawrence North was really ascending into one of the, one of the premier teams in the state, either in the North or the South. She had 33 points in that game. They were down by nine, I think a couple of times, but Valparaiso and Lily Barnes specifically plates just such under control. And the one thing about Lily specifically is Lawrence North couldn't speed her up, and that's what they do. I mean, they, they really get into – they got into Lampley. They got into Makaluski. Um, they got into Reagan Wilson when they played. And Kaya Hurt and Winston and all of these kids, they tried multiple defenders on Lillian Barnes, and she was just so calm. You couldn't speed her up. She's very sturdy. She's gotten a lot older, more, more, more mature with her basketball, uh, more mature with her frame. And I was – I came away really, really, really impressed. She's always had a name that's – kind of been on a trajectory to be one of the best players in the, in 26. And this is really her opportunity. And I think I said it in kind of the, the bracket show, but I think this is her opportunity that if she can get a sectional championship, who knows? I mean, they, they might have a potential matchup against uh, a Northridge or a Warsaw in regional, which is another winnable, an, another winnable game. But Lillian Barnes is really putting, um, respect on her name. And so I just wanted to have an opportunity to give her her flowers because she's looked great this year. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm with Valpo uh, as well for sectional two. I mean, I think you guys, you know, hit on all the, you know, the key points Valpo. If somebody's going to pick them off, I mentioned Chesterton um, Davis and Bradley for them. They're two sophomores. They're both averaging North of 15 points, 15 to 17 a game. Maybe it's there if they get hot on the right night. And then crown point is just such an interesting team because Ava Zalkowski I mean, she's capable, as we've seen, of scoring 50-plus a game. Like, she's unbelievable. Like, talking to her, it's like once she gets going a little bit, she's the ball go through and adjust herself to the physicality of whatever junk defense is being thrown at her, she takes off. The, the big question with Crown Point and the thing that's been kind of their bugaboo this season is that they're so young around her. And it's just trying to find out how, you know, find their way as a group to support Ava. Uh, but, again, you know, I mean, they've had a full season now. They won another close game last night. I think it was. I forget who it was against, but I was following it on Twitter. Uh, so, I mean, maybe Crown Point does it. And, and I think that the section will be more competitive than what maybe you'd think going in. So I don't want to write off everybody completely, but I think just Valpo is probably the favorite, obviously. Yeah, I like agree. Said, Ava's fantastic. I mean, she only, she averages like 29 points a game. But I think the biggest thing for them is like they're averaging as a team, they're averaging 21 turnovers a game and they're only shooting 29% from three. So 
unless Ava gets some help. Uh, you know, it looks like Valpo. While Hank comes back, which is going to be interesting because I don't, I guess he can let himself back into the link. <laughs> Crown Point, when they played Valparaiso earlier in the year, only scored 29 points in that game. They lost by 16, but only scored 29 points. So I would suspect that that game will play a little bit differently. Um, they'll probably have to go back to that film and see how they can regain some rhythm and some efficiency. But obviously, 29 isn't going to cut it. Um, but there was obviously something schematic going on in that game, which disallowed them to, to score and make it a more competitive game. The thing, too, that I'll go back to with Ava Zalkowski is just how efficient she is shooting the ball. She's shooting north of 50% from the field, 36% from three, and then 78% at the line. This is as of um, December. But, I mean, she's an efficient shooter despite, again, just every all the junk junk defenses that she – that she faces. Um, anything else? Any closing thoughts before we bounce over um, to sectional four? I don't think so. No, Danny. Or uh, yeah, let's. We talked about South Bend, Washington. They're the favorite. Actually, as I'm looking at John Harrell now, they're 96 percent favorite, almost 97 percent to advance to their sectional um, in South Bend. But for a in uh, sectional four with Northridge and Warsaw, Josh, I know you've been chopping at the bit because Warsaw. Fits the breed of a, a typical Josh Sable team. Oh my God! This is this is uh this is my upset special right here. I, I think Warsaw is going to win the sectional, and then I like them in in a in a one game regional format. I like them at the regional against Valpo. Um, now my only concern is they might be a year away because their 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 three best players are sophomores. And uh, a junior, I think. And but the, the reason why I love them so much is that they shoot 37% as a team from three. Uh, they turn it over 13 times a game. Um, and in the last couple of weeks, they've had huge wins. They beat uh, North Northridge by 13, and they beat Homestead by 21. So, like we were saying earlier, like recent performance matters a big deal and i think these girls uh we've got you know brooke zartman jocelyn uh bricker and brooke uh, winchester between the four of them or sorry between the three of those girls they made 141 threes so if they keep shooting the lights out and taking care of it like i like them in that first game against north northridge and then uh you know to go up against valpo at the regional you know you only got to win one game now OK, um, and like I said, it might be a year early for them, but I, I just love uh, the way that they play. Um, and, and and I think they could, you know, shock some people. Danny, you know, when you have a team that that shoots a lot of threes, it, it's such a cliche, but cliches are the way they are because they're true. You're going to live and die by it. So. If you if you look at Elkhart, for example, like Ken Hunt, OK, in that second game, 12 and nine, um, you know, not a record that jumps out and says that they're a huge threat. But in knowing him personally, I mean, he's going to put a plan in place to to shade his defenders toward three point shooters. So I think things very simple basketball concepts like extra pass, um, squaring your shoulders, doing your work before you catch the ball, I think will be big for a three-point shooting team like Warsaw. But I'm with Josh. I, I really like them this year. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I like them as much to prognosticate that they're going to be one of the four teams in the North Final Four for semi-state. Um, but I think that um, – I think that very – yeah, correct. I think that Warsaw-Northridge matchup early, I think, is going to tell us a lot about the eventual winner for this sectional. Courtney, what about you? What do you make of that thing? I agree with Danny. Uh, you live and, buy by, and die by the three. And, like, if Warsaw can stay hot and get hot through the whole tournament, like, you got to give it to them. Like, watch out for them. We see it in every other tournament level, the NCAA, um, IHSA, any of it. If you're on fire from three, you'll make a run. But if you are off and that's your bread and butter, you're going to go home early uh, and real early. So it just depends. It's one of those things. I mean, that's why we play the game, right? Like, Show up. Let's see. We'll see what they can do. But I mean, Brooke Zartman. I was seeing she's putting up like she hit seven of 11 threes in a game. Like she's putting up. Like she's she's knocking down the three at a very efficient level. But 
she's going to – it's now, you know, it's scoutable. So, like, people know that. How does she respond when now it's out there, you're a great three-point shooter, you're a great three-point shooting team, and if that gets defended, can they take it to the rack? Can they have a mid-range game? Can they exploit defenses and win in other ways besides the three? So that's the, que the question mark for the Tigers. Warsaw comes in, or as of now, as we record this on Thursday afternoon, uh, they have a game yet to go against Angola, but they won five straight after losing three in a row. Warsaw, that is. But I mean, those losses were two. One of them was to Brownsburg. They lost to a, a D, you know a solid Jefferson team, Jeffersonville team. They've also played Westfield, so Warsaw's played a pretty tough schedule. Um, and then Northridge, they hung with uh, Fort Wayne Snyder the other night, fifty to forty-four was the final over there. So, a couple battle-tested teams, a couple interesting. Uh, That'll definitely be an interesting matchup there on opening night. Yeah, and, and listen, Northridge is no slouch either. Like, they very, very easily could win this game. I mean, they'll be the favorite. I think Sagarin's got them at a 95 and uh, Warsaw at a 90. But also Northridge is at home. So you got to give them a couple points, uh, you know, for the home court advantage as well. I mean, you know, Northridge will be favored in this game. And if they beat Warsaw, they'll probably win the sectional. And then, like I said, I, I, I like, you know, their chances at, at regional uh, as well. I mean, they're they're very, very good. I got to gotta throw in my – as I was studying the sectional, my sleeper team in this sectional is Penn. Uh, don't right. sleep on Penn. I mean, they took – it was a two-point loss um, to Northridge in late December. So, don't sleep on Penn either because if they get it going, it could be interesting. Good stuff. I like it. I like the sleeper play. A uh, couple, three names to know from um, Northridge as I stare through Max Preps. Ryland Goodridge, uh, Morgan Cross, and Ella Muhammad are all averaging around 10 points per game. So they got kind of a balanced scoring attack versus the the high-powered explosiveness of Warsaw. But like you said, Josh, I mean, it's it's not going to be an easy out for, no. for either team there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Probably but, the best game opening night. I'd say on the north side uh, for the sectional, definitely. Yeah, I think that's fair. I'm yeah, everything that I've been looking at is on the south side or in another class. I think that's a I think that's a tight read. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's shift down a little bit closer here. We're going to move to Fort Wayne Carroll, where uh, you have Northrop, you have Fort Wayne Snyder. That's the big matchup. That's a that's a good one. I don't know if it's on opening night, but that'll be a good an interesting game. Northrop just the other night was with Columbia City. They had a lead at halftime. Uh, then Addie Baxter went off to to win it for Columbia City. Fort Wayne Snyder, we've talked about a lot. We mentioned Jordan Poole at the top of the show. Uh, just an unbelievable, talented team there. So, uh, Danny, let's start with you. I like Reggie Tharp's system at Snyder, and I like how he's built it around Jordan Poole. She's got pieces around her, but she's obviously the central piece, so you want to have the ball in your playmaker's hands. And what I like about Reggie's system is that he allows Poole to play in transition. He allows Poole to probe and live ball change of possession, but she – after she gets a high ball screen and a lot of their uh, a lot of their change of possession, she also goes off kind of a UCLA screen and then a flare screen. So she has probe opportunity or transition opportunity, probe opportunity. She gets a ball screen at the top. And then if she doesn't have anything there, instead of emptying out like most guards do into the weak side, she gets another flare action and then touches it again. So if pool can be effective in any of those opportunities, it's going to make Snyder a really, really difficult team to beat. They are the really chalky pick here. And then you have just not not too long ago, you had role players like Kyra Parker, I think it was her name. I think she had 13 points against Homestead. Sims, Sims uh, is the beneficiary of a lot of pools assists. And then Donahue, I think, though, is the key to a deep run for Snyder in addition to Jordan Poole's offensive efficiency. Donahue guards the best player on the opposite team every time. And not to pick on Donahue at all, but, you know, Reagan got 30 again. Reagan Wilson got 30 against her. Maya Epps got 27 against her. Donahue's got to dig her heels in. If that's her job, she's got to star in that role and really stand up against the other team's Batman, if you will, and limit them so, so pool can be effective. But I think the biggest threat to them, um, and just a couple sentences about Katie Katie Jackson's Northrop outfit. I mean, they had a they had they they've only lost games to really good teams. I mean, they lost to Bedford North Lawrence, which was they actually led it late. They lost by five. South Bend, Washington, Noblesville, uh, Snyder, Columbia City, Homestead, like those are all their losses. And when they were favored, they won. 
And so they have good players. They have Kayla Williams Thornton, who had 38 earlier in, in a game. They have Lexi Cassiter, who's a senior point guard. Like they have good players. And that is, Hank, you had alluded, is that an opening night matchup? It is. And so Snyder, I'm not putting them on upset, upset alert, but boy, Tuesday night, 730 before the tournament really even starts, they have to play the next best team in the sectional, which I think can 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 eliminate them, but can also jumpstart them to a very deep run. Northrop's in a, in a tough spot. Destiny Craig, I think I heard in the South Bend Washington yeah. broadcast is out for the year with an injury. She is out. She is yeah. out. That's a, a tough break for her, a tough break for Northrop, but maybe a game that'll be closer than people expect. But I think Snyder's probably a, a, a safe pick there as I look at it at least. Uh, Josh or Courtney, did you guys have anything to add on that group? Yeah, like I said, I've, I've got number, I got Fort Wayne Snyder number one in uh, my uh, rankings right now, uh, mainly because the reason why I have them number one, yes, Jordan Poole, obviously, I, I said I said that earlier, you know, when you get to the tournament, you have to have someone that can score an unstructured play, and she can, but the reason why I have them rated, rated so high is that they not only get a lot of extra possessions, and not only do they play at a, at a really, really a good pace, but they don't throw the ball over. So when I see 11 turnovers a game at the pace that they play, that's going to set them up for success. Now, I do think they're going to win their sectional, but their regional game is going to be from regional eight. So, it, you know, they are going to to be, you know, uh, tested, uh, you know, uh, you know, pretty early in this tournament. I like Snyder. I think uh, the thing with Snyder is if I look at the four Wayne Snyder team like this is their year. Uh, with with the pool where she's at, and this has this has been something that they've been building for a long time um, to get to this point. And so it would be really disappointing for everything that they've put in to to go out earlier. Like they just have to be so locked in, and um, it's, it all comes down to like how bad do they want it and mental toughness. And I'll talk about that later on in one of the other sectionals. Like that's going to be the X factor for Fort Wayne Snyder. Can they be mentally tough? Can they ride the ups and downs, and can they be so hungry that they just go out and they they just – I want to see them go out and just destroy everybody and just have this chip on their shoulder because that's the type of basketball team that I think they can be, and whether or not they'll do it, we'll see. Any closing thoughts from you, Danny? Are you ready to, to jump on to sectional six? No, I mean, I've got notes on six, so I'm ready for six. All right, baby, lead us off on sectional six with your notes. <laughs> If we get Columbia City and Homestead, we had in the in the in the bracket special, we had talked about how this is Columbia City's step that they know is there. They know they have to climb. They're not going to think about anything on top until they climb the step that 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 Homestead presents. I think the key, if they were to to see this basketball game, is going to be their communication and switch, um, and recognition of personnel. Ankenbrook, Mollering, and Helsum are all 40% three-point shooters and all capable of changing a basketball game uh, with the with the flick of a wrist. And so I, I go back to a game that Columbia City played earlier in the year against Hamilton Southeastern, which is another popular three-point shooting team. They've got to recognize where they are and they can't, they can't lose any switches. In regards to three-point shooting, because you have kids like Ankenbrook and Mollering and Helsum and kids that are going to launch it up there, the Achilles, one of the Achilles heels of Columbia City is going to always be their rebounding. And in one of the games they lost to Lures, they were they were killed on the glass. I mean, if if Homestead is going to shoot 18 to 25 threes, I mean, that that's potentially, you know, nine to 15, you could say just kind of 50 50 basketballs. A Columbia City's got to crash five to the glass. They've got to possess it. They've got to they've got to control the glass and something that if they get away from if that if the if the rebounding battle gets away from them, I think they could find themselves in a little bit of trouble. Um, and then lastly, and I think this kind of leads into kind of where where Courtney really kind of lives with the, the training of players is this is going to be a motion control, I think, for them as well. Um, it's a home game. It's a big game. It's the sectional championship will be on the line after 32 minutes. They have to play under control and they have to play. They have to control their emotions to, to allow themselves to shoot the ball, to make good decisions and play under control. So 
I think those th those three keys, I think, is what I look at. We talked about how it's at home. We we've talked a lot about Columbia City, but I think if they're going to finally climb this step, I think those three things are are really really important. Courtney, I'm looking forward to. I mean, they got to take care of their of their games first. Columbia City's got to win that first game, get through Huntington North. But I'm look, really looking forward. Um, I got it on my calendar. Date night might take the kids, maybe, but. They go to that game, and I'm looking forward to seeing a great basketball game and uh, being able to talk more about those teams after that game. But I'm I'm so fired up for that matchup that's coming up. And like we talked about last week, too, the environment there is just going to be unbelievable. I mean, I saw <clears throat> some video and some pictures in their game just the other night against Northrop, and it was tons of people in the stands. It looked like it was loud rock. I said a student section would make such a big difference at these games, too, You know, as I'm sure all three of us can attest to it, just, or all four of us can attest to it makes such a big difference when the students are there and engaged and make a noise. It makes just everything so much more fun and so much more intense. And, North, and um, Columbia City has that in spades. Homestead, I'm sure, will travel well for a game like this. Um, and it's going to be really fun, really, really fun. Josh, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, if I, if I had all the information, I'm pretty sure Columbia City would have been number one for me. Um, and I think the reason why they're number one is because they've done it wire to wire. If you remember, we did this podcast, the very first one, like we were talking about Columbia City, like right in the very first podcast. So the fact that they've done it wire to wire, 26 straight the schedule, their Sagarin's 102, 18 and 2 record. They, you know, they won the Hall of Fame classic, you know, uh, and they've won nine to ten. And, you know, I think you know, Addy Baxter and that crew, like like I I I am expecting a deep run. Uh, but like you said, Homestead's no slouch. I mean, they're kind of right there. Um, I guess, you know, the only concern really is just, you know, how they've been playing recently. You know, they've only won three out of the last five. You know, they they lost to uh, Warsaw by 20. But, uh, you know, I expect that to be a really, really good game. But I, I do like Columbia City a lot. Let's keep our eye on Maya Epps, too. I mean, Columbia City allowed my Makaluski to go for 30. Maya Epps had 27 when they played Snyder in a big game. If Columbia City does play this pack line switching defense where they close out on the shooters, the middle of the floor is going to be open. And Maya Epps has shown the ability in a in in the in the Snyder game to get into the paint, and that that looked every bit like a half uh, a halftime adjustment by Coach Rod Parker. And we talk a lot about how he is so good in postseason preparation and postseason coaching that depending on how the game flow goes, if Columbia City does decide to say you're not going to beat us from the three-point line, I think Maya Epps has maybe graduated to a place where she can single-handedly win the game in the middle of the floor. So I think Columbia City has to guard her, keep her out of the paint. I would expect Addie Baxter to draw that assignment. But if Addie's going to need a lot of help, you're going to have to come off, off of shooters. And if Maya Epps can throw strikes – they're going to, they're, they're, they're going to hit the net. Columbia city too. We've talked about it a lot. They talk about it every time or the, the times that I've talked to him is just the depth that Columbia city has with Baxter's obviously the headline getter. And I think in order for them to win a game, like the one against Homestead, it's going to take a big game from her, just like we saw against Northrop, but Kendra sheets, I think gets overlooked a lot. And I think I mentioned this before, just because she doesn't have a D one school next to her. She has Huntington. I mean, she's a great player. She's really talented, and they're part of such a big. She's part of such a big senior core with the Toggle Kid and Faith Fry, um, Molly Baker, right? Um, and they just have so many different weapons there around there, which makes a big difference. And two, these games and sectionals, like or not, it seems like they're officiated a little differently. So if Addie's to run into foul troubles, we saw against at the Hall of Fame Class against Indian Creek, it's obviously not an apples to apples comparison, but these kids know how to step up in these moments. And when you have the home. The home crowd and hometown environment too supporting. I think that's going to make a difference. The question is, how do you handle the pressure? Because they've never done this before. Homestead has, and it's the same thing when we go to talk about the South with BNL and Jennings County later this weekend. It's the same thing. Like one team's never done it before. The other one, this is all they really know. So how does that factor in on the mental side of things? And which team is able to find their find their rhythm, get into groove fastest? and get going because there's going to probably be just a little bit of a feeling out process because they haven't played each other yet this year. Um, and so they got a great, I mean, I know they have to get by Homestead, obviously not, not cause they're very good. Uh, but they also got a great draw and for the regional. Um, so that also helps.
while we're here and we're, we'll do what we did with uh, South and Washington Lake Central, let's talk about the McCutcheon. They're looking like the favorite in their sectional. Um, how exciting would it be to see Lily Graves, their standout freshman, playing on the regional stage in year one against either Homestead, Columbia State, or whoever it is uh, that should emerge in that sectional? Danny? Yeah, that's, you know, Lily Graves is probably measured on a different standard right now because she's so young, but her production isn't young. Um, and so if if Columbia City does get through, it means they kind of centrally handled kids like Maya Epps. And I think the same principles will apply game plan wise in clogging the paint and, and uh, allowing, you know, and making other players beat them, if you will. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see Columbia City, if they can, if they can do to Maya Epps, what they do to Lily Graves, that's going to be a, it, it could potentially be a tough night for him, but, um, but you're right. I mean, I, I think in kind of naturally transitioning to sectional seven, you know, outside of Riley Whitlock, um, who from Har from Harrison in sectional seven, she's a D one volleyball recruit. I was at a McCutcheon game not long ago, was sitting next to Katie Gerald's name drop, Josh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> she, I, was mar I was marveling at this kid. Like if, if she just quit volleyball, okay. And please don't Riley. Cause I, I bet you're amazing at it. You <laughs> Danny Riley, Riego hates volleyball. You heard Riley, that. <laughs> Stop it. At coach Danny Riego. At just let me know when you guys are done. Yeah. It's <laughs> volleyball, which is awkward. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, but it's led to some, some friction uh, between the two boxes there on the left, because Josh's daughter, as we all know, is a volleyball player. Yeah. But Danny and his constant degradation of volleyball, a wonderful yeah. sport that I call. Oh, I, I'm aware. I'm aware. I'm yeah, aware of it. it is is really disgusting, and I'm, I'm just disappointed, my buddy. Danny, go ahead. Okay. I think Riley Whitlock is outside of Lily Graves is the most interesting player in this sectional because I was marveling at her, her frame, her athleticism, um, you know what she could do, and. You just never really know if, if if Whitlock matches up against Graves and sectionals when they see him, you know, can she present some problems? I, when they played in the regular season, Lily didn't have much of a problem. I, I think she had 20 in that game, um, but she made it hard. But that's probably outside of Lily Graves, the most interesting name here. And Harrison probably poses the biggest threat to McCutcheon, Columbia City or Homestead um, in kind of upsetting the apple cart. She's probably the key to unlocking that. What's impressed me about McCutcheon as I followed them a little bit more closely this year is that even on nights when Lily is held in check, like against Danville, for instance, they're having other kids step up. And some of their wins, I think it was Benton, Benton Central early in the year, another kid stepped up and got them going and found them a way to win that game. And then there's games when you see Lily taking over like against Carol Floor. I was at that game and she went for like 19 points in the fourth quarter alone or something insane like that. And What's, yeah. what's so unique about watching her play, and I've referenced this before, is that you watch her, and even when she's struggling, like she struggled through the first two-plus quarters of that game against Carroll, you can see like, oh, this is why this kid is so good. This is why everybody is so impressed with her. Just the body control around the basket, her ability to get there and get up to the rim is really impressive. And it's the sort of things, like as these shots aren't falling, it's like, oh, once she gets a little stronger, a little bit older, and she's not competing against, you know, 18-year-old women inside – she's really going to start to click and it's all going to come together for her. And then too, I mean, it's probably a little bit overlooked, but what she does defensively too, with just the length that she brings is, is really disruptive. And, and it's a, a big strength there for McCutcheon. Yeah. And I was just, I was just going to say this too. Like I think McCutcheon is the favorite to win their sectional. I expect on the winner sectional and they're, they're going to meet the winner of more, more than likely the winner of Columbia city homestead at the regional. And I think Homestead or Columbia City would be a huge favorite in that game, in that regional game. But the thing is, is like when you're a freshman, sometimes like, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know. And the next thing you know, you show up and you score 30 and then you're moving on. Like it's like so sometimes like having that like like, you know, you you, you don't even know like what's happening. Like you're a freshman, like, you know, no one's told you like. Oh, well, you know, these girls are older and they've been here and they have the experience. Like she doesn't care about that. She's just going to go out there and ball. And who knows, like she might, you know, uh, you know, make some noise in the tournament. 
One of the things before you move us on, Hank, one of the things that Jeff Conoy does, the, the coach at McCutcheon, he does a really good job of is he mixes up his defenses. In every basketball game that I've seen McCutcheon play this year, I've seen them play five, six defenses, whether it's odd front zone in the three quarter, whether it's two, two, one full court, whether it's full court man, whether it's even something like triangle and two pack line. I mean, he is always changing it up and he's changing it up on the fly. He's got this loud whistle and he's changing it up and his kids can get that stuff's really difficult to prepare for. And so um, when you have Lily Graves, I would add the the coaching prowess of Jeff Conoy to it also. I mean, they're 18 and three with a central with their central piece as a freshman like that's a heck of a season regardless of what happens in sectional and regional McCutcheon is on the map one thing too with McCutcheon and what's exciting about them is that we talked about teams kind of being a year ahead of schedule and I don't know if they're ahead of schedule but their brighter brightest days are definitely ahead of them like they're graduating one senior from next year everybody else like all their main contributors when you look at them with Max Preps and Freshmen and sophomores, and a few juniors buying and filling in with depth. The seniors, fill, one senior filling in for depth, but they're a really young team, and it'll be exciting to watch them grow. And then as they grow, just how the schedule changes and how it toughens up. Because I know their conference doesn't bring a ton, but I mean that's the type of player we saw it with Lily Barnes. And I remember talking to Candy Wilson, Valparaiso's coach, about how she wanted to make it a point to get Lily down around this area of the state, get her into Central Indiana, get her against teams like Noblesville, which they did obviously. And, you know, teams like Norwell and just to play games like that to get her that exposure. Lily obviously doesn't need probably the same sort of boost, but it's going to be really exciting to see them when they play a, a team like a, a Fishers or an HSE or, or somebody like that. Like, can you imagine a battle next year between a senior Maya Makaluski and a, a sophomore Lily Graves? I mean, that's that's going to be really exciting. And too, just watching over these years and tracking how McCutcheon grows with all those young kids as they settle and get more used to the varsity level. It'll be fun to see and, and it'll make for a fun week next week. Uh, Courtney, I'll let you close this out there on sectional seven. Absolutely. When you have a player with the trajectory that Lily Graves has, it comes down to the want and the will to win. And if you put the ball in, a, in the hands of a Lily Graves during the tournament, like Josh said earlier, like you have no idea what's going to happen. Like she, she has the mentality. She just wants to win and she's going to find every way possible. So I'm super excited to see this is her first, state tournament um, that she's going to be playing in here in high school. So I'm super excited to see what Lily Graves does because she could take this Mavs team on her back and take them on a really fun ride. Absolutely. <clears throat> that brings us to sectional eight, the final one for today's show in terms of individual sectionals. Um, I'll start off with this. If you're looking at the uh, computer rankings, it's Hamilton Southeastern and Nobles will both with around a 31% chance of winning the sectional. I think maybe the Buy in there. I'll leave any analysis to the actually. Signs at 19, Fishers at 15, and then 1% to 2% for Westfield and Carmel. First of all, and, and Danny, I'll start with you. You surprised that it's stacked up the way it is with Hamilton, Southeastern, and Noblesville 1 and 2? No, I, I, I'm not surprised at all. This is, this is a throw the records out, throw everything out. This is a matchup kind of thing. We The very first episode that we ever did, for, and I think the podcast was called something different at the time. We talked about how this was all just like practice for Noblesville. Um, look, it, th th these are all one game seasons now. And, and it is survive in advance. And if you lose, your season is done. And if you win, you move right. And then you get another really good opponent. But there's such familiarity with the coaches. There's such familiarity with the players. There's such familiarity with the scheme that I'm not surprised that the favorite only has a 31% chance to win this sectional. And it, it's, you know, we, I mean, we save obviously the lion's share to, to break this one down, but this one is such a cliche, but it's, it's so wide open. It's just, and, and everything can change after the result of one basketball game. And that's, that's, that's including Westfield and Carmel, like take Carmel, for example, right? Carmel beat Noblesville this year. Like, one of the teams that has one of the better chances to win it beat them pretty handily at home um, and played really well. So there's, there's upsets that could happen. Um, there's great games that could happen. Everybody's in the same building now. It's not cross town. So this one is going to get really interesting. Yeah. You mentioned that. And I was looking at the semifinals today. Um, it, it is real. I mean, no matter who it is that advanced out of those four teams, the two that advance into Friday semifinal, it's going to be a great game and there's storylines abound. I mean, Zionsville went to overtime with Westfield. Eight, they had a 10-point lead late against HSC. One, one, lost the other. And then on the other side of things, Carmel beat Nozor only like you alluded to. And the Fishers game wasn't close, 
But, I mean, we saw what happened last year. It was overtime. That was an amazing game. And then, too, the winner of that specific matchup has gone on to Gamebridge the past two seasons. And it, it wouldn't – I wouldn't put it past them to do it again. And I know – I think I'm. I would assume that looking at records, people probably assume that Noblesville's down. And I mean, I wouldn't pick. I wouldn't pick them against anybody. You know, like they have just as good a chance as anybody of that top four, four to five teams there in that sectional to win the whole thing. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me to see them go on a deep run. The one thing that concerns me with Noblesville, though, is the thing that's been a problem for them since day one, and that's the free throw shooting. Uh, it cost them against Zionsville. It's cost them in some other games. It's allowed some other games to be close. It cost me against HSE too, for instance. Uh, and this time of year, I mean, that's one thing that really gets magnified, obviously, is the free throw shooting. That's one concern for Noblesville. But then on the flip side, uh, we've seen Bregan Wilson, Meredith Tipner's ability to take over games. CC Quigley's come along. Ava Shoemaker, kind of like an X factor for them. She's a really talented player. But it'll be it'll be fun. Josh. Yeah, I think, you know, for, for me, like when I was giving you guys my rankings earlier, I I had in this order, I had uh, Noblesville was at the top, right? And then it was Zionsville. Then I had HSC third, and then I had Fishers fourth, right? So you're probably thinking, well, why is HSC like picked to win the sectional, but you have them like down a lot farther than than other people? And I think the the thing for me that is a huge concern is recent play. Yeah. Um, if you look at it, they're three and two in their last five games. In those five games, they're giving up 65 points per game defensively. And Courtney will tell you, like, if you don't defend, you got no chance. So if I'm coach sat, like I've lost a lot of sleep over the last two weeks, like everything was sunshine and rainbows two weeks ago. You're number one in the state. You're cruising along. You arguably have the best player in the state on your team. We know that Holman and Stidham are fantastic players. They got good role players. You, they can score it at a clip, but you also have to defend and I think that's been their biggest Achilles heel. And the thing about Noblesville that I like is that, and I said this earlier, they turn the ball over only nine times a game, but no one has played more meaningful basketball games in the last two or three years than Noblesville. So I think it's, it's a coin flip really, but you know, I could see any of the, those four teams, Fishers, HSC, Zionsville, Noblesville winning it. But right now, if I'm HSC, I'm concerned. Well, let's Courtney. stay on that defensive point for a little bit. So Josh brought up kind of their recent performance. Uh, they gave up 74 points against Center Grove. They gave up 72 against Zionsville, 71 against Pike. I mean, these are teams also that that, that don't try to score 70. Again. Like Center Grove doesn't go out and try and score 70. No, They just unfold it against them. So if you look back at the second half of the Zionsville game where, you know, albeit they gave up 72 points against Zionsville, this, the, almost the entire fourth quarter, they played KK Holman and their other point guard, Ant Green at the same time. And I think that was a lineup that Satterfield is starting to recognize that that is their Achilles heel in, the, in, in being able to guard people. That is their best defensive lineup when both of those two kids are at the same time in the game at the same time. I and mean, a lot's been made of the way KK Holman guards the ball, but arguably, I mean, you could say that KK Holman might not even be the best on ball defender on our team. Like Ant Green can really bother opposing guards. And this allows if they can keep if they can keep opposing guards out of the paint. And there's great guards in, in, in this sectional. Great guards in this sectional. But if they can if they can limit paint touches by the opposing guards it allows Makaluski and Stidham to not have to work as hard on the defensive side and they can work on and they can really focus on scoring the basketball, which is what they want to do. But I think one of the most important players in this sectional isn't even a starter on Southeastern. It's Ant Green, because I think Ant Green and KK Holman now, if they can if they can get out and bother guards, I think it's going to give HSC an advantage and maybe erase some of this recent performance that Josh is speaking about. So I have a question for Courtney, because she knows better than than all of us. Like I, I'm a real big believer that like your habits start in the summer. Like you're setting the tone defensively 
and you're holding people accountable in the summer. So then that way, when February rolls around, you're, you're, you're ready to go. Like 65 points a game, like, like Courtney, is, is that, would that, would that be a concern for you? Here's my concern. I understand the defensive side. Like they gotta, they gotta really lock that in. My, my concern with Hamlin Southeastern is their control of the game on offense. Like they'll have big leads and then they're, they're jacking up a three up 15 with four minutes to go in the fourth. Like, if you, you can't do that in this sectional, like you, there's no lead that is that is far enough ahead in this sectional. And so like having that IQ of, no, we need to make, you know, maybe two more passes and keep swinging around because you got to work the offense because what's happening is early shots, you know, you know, one reversal, we're jacking a shot up 15, like that turns into points on the other end and you're giving the other team so many opportunities to score. So it, it'll be interesting, but I think that on the, I'm going to, swing off of that defense is the offensive. Like they have to control when like any team that gets up in this sectional, they have got to control that lead because yeah. you can real quick. I agree. Uh, shot selection and defense go hand in hand. No question. Yeah, absolutely. The team, if HSE, the winner of the HSE Westfield game, and we'll, we'll swing back to Westfield, but Zionsville and um, what they bring, it's been a great season for Zionsville uh, despite graduating a Miss basketball and Layla Hall from last year. And some other really talented pieces. I mean, Emma Hans really stepped up. Allie Caldwell has been super impressive. I know we've talked about her. Mackenzie Chapman, the freshmen's come in. And what's really unique about Zionsville is that they have a two-post look um, with Brooke Karish and Caroline Sampson inside. And that's a luxury that nobody else in that section has. And I talked to Andy McGuire about it um, after they beat Noblesville. And he likes it because of what it brings offensively. But obviously, when you're playing these teams that have so many talented guards and often play a four-guard look, it, it really handcuffs you defensively. So I'm really interested to see how Zionsville handles that and how they strike that balance because one thing that stood out with Center Grove was just the game that um, Wirtz had, Rachel Wirtz had. She was owning the paint. She was doing a really good job inside. And Zionsville can double those to action like that where if they miss a couple threes, you know, they have the big bodies inside to pull in the rebound. So I'm really interested to see how Zionsville will – oh, my goodness. Zionsville manages that their lineup. Yeah, I, this is my sleeper pick right here. I, I really do think Zionsville can win this sectional, uh, and, and that's why I had them ranked higher than HSC. And I and I guess we'll find out if HSC takes care of business in, in the first round. But I think the thing about uh, Zionsville that I really like is they have a lot of experience. They are very well coached, so you know their preparation level is going to be off the charts. And remember, we said this last pod, they're going to have the advantage of uh, of, of preparation in, 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 if they see HSC uh, you know, in that second round, uh, and you know, they shoot 38% as a team from three, which is a huge advantage, um, for them. And, and, and like I said, I, I you know, I, th they've had really close losses. Like they lost by Ford HSC, I think a week or week or two ago. Um, a lot of experienced players, very well organized coaching staff. Like they have a great shot at winning this thing. No question. Two of Andy McGuire's offensive concepts he he runs dribble drive okay so there's you know four guards right there and it's a kind of a two gap kind of thing where there's no ball screen and then he runs kind of a one four flat central third high ball screen also those are typically sets where you're going to allow players to make plays and for zionsville to upset hamilton southeastern or or westfield or whoever it is or to make a deep run in this sectional They've got to make plays because Andy's going to allow them to make these plays in his dribble drive or his flat ball screen action. And, 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 and Courtney, you know that because, you know, you played, played for me. I mean, if, if, if Caldwell, Han and Leedy, all great guards can find a matchup that they like, Andy has shown throughout the season that he's going to continue to go there and make them adjust. And I think that will be an interesting part of the game flow to see, but this run that they're having is because those guards are offensively producing. I mean, Allie Caldwell, before she fouled out of the Hamilton South, South, Southeastern game, was a big part of the reason why they had that 10-point lead that Hank spoke of in the third quarter and another 10-point lead in the fourth quarter. She had 27 points in only 20 minutes of action. And Emma Hahn was a secondary look. And there's also been games that Hank could point to five of them where Emma Hahn's been the best player on the floor. So they have players – and they have a coach that's going to allow them to make plays, and they're going to be well-prepared. Like Josh said, they are a scary, scary team. 
but this one is going to come down to those three guards and their ability to be offensively productive in, in, in my opinion. And, and just a piggyback on that real quick about Andy and his staff. No one runs better out of timeouts, blob, slob. So they're going to steal probably six to eight points, which is huge in, 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 the, in tournament play. Emma Hahn, I remember her sophomore year, I think it was. She had a broken hand or something like that. But anyway, she missed some time in the middle of the season. And just the difference in Zionsville from when she went out to when she returned was noticeable. And I remember talking to Andy about that when I was doing a feature on Layla Hall. It was just a difference that it was, just how big of a difference Emma's made. So it's really cool seeing her development. She's going to Vermont. And then we mentioned, obviously, Ali Caldwell, too. Don't want to put the cart before the horse, though. I mean, Westfield gets hot. They could knock off HSC. And then if it's Zionsville Westfield, I mean, Ellie Kelleher, another kid who's coming on strong, a senior for them, she went for 29 the first time. They forced overtime. They have some good pieces around her. Um, Lindsey Van Dyke comes to mind, Kira Loveless. Um, a lot of good, good, talented pieces around there with some experience, a team that could surprise some people. And, and the way that the sectionals built and the way that sectionals work, I and mean, it wouldn't, it would surprise me, but it wouldn't stun me by any means to see Westfield pop off and win a game or two. The, qu the question that's been raised about Westfield is their is their ability to score the ball, and of course they yeah. have one of the one of the best offensive outputs in the state in the opening round. So I think I think I put a lot on on Kelleher, but she'll show up. She she definitely will. She's a great player on both ends of the floor. The kid that I point to as next factors is Crockett. You know Crockett is she's great at executing a game plan. She's great on the defensive side. She's not going to make a lot of mistakes. She's very much like Aubrey Booker at center Grove. She's just going to be on the floor affecting the game in a lot of different positive ways, but she has some offensive prowess and she's got to show it in this game against Hamilton Southeastern. If she does and they can keep it close, maybe they can catch lightning in a bottle in the fourth quarter through a Kelleher or something like that. But I think she's probably the key. Cause I think they're going to have to score the ball against HSE and it kind of leads back to the, you know, can HSC guard them kind of thing. This will be a great opportunity for them to kind of jumpstart their run in a team that isn't as, as, as offensively proficient as maybe some of the other teams in this, in this bracket. Courtney. This is a, uh, earlier I talked about mental toughness and this was a section I was talking about. Sectional eight needs to be renamed mental toughness sectional because we know that any team can come out of the sectional and it really comes down to mental toughness, which is a skill that is built. It goes back to what Josh was talking about. It's things that you've done during the offseason. Have your coaches put you in tough situations. You're down by three with a minute left or like put you in those opportunities for your brain to get trained on those things. And can you play defense and playing defense and being locked into a scouting report, being locked in, communicating on switches, on all those different things, knowing personnel, knowing the game plan. That's mental toughness. Like you just have to be so locked in. You have to ride the waves. There's going to be highs. There's going to be lows. Like the minute that any of these teams start feeling sorry for themselves, they're going to get their butt kicked. Bottom line, like they're they're that you have to stay locked in for that whole entire ball game to have the chance to advance. Yeah, I agree. We you know we used to call that high emotional intelligence. Like, and it's something that you can't just flip on and on like a light switch. Like that's something that you have to have built in the off season, built in the weight room. You know, really, really hard practices, hard drills. Like Courtney said, like you, you're 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 building them for this 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 time of year because it's winter go home and, and high emotional intelligence in in, in section eight is going to be big. One last team to touch on here, and that's Fishers. I want to spotlight specifically Talia Harris. She's really really taken off here of late. She had 20 points in three of her past four games. She had 29 against Mother Macaulay out of Illinois. And on a personal note, I have a story coming out on Talia and her older sister, Ty, of WNBA fame, uh, coming up here, I think, on Friday. Um, so just keep an eye out Very for that. Cool. But it's it's been awesome seeing how she's grown. And then, I mean, obviously, the pieces around them are big. But it seems like Fishers every year. Last year was the thing. I, I think it was like 0.2% or something like that. They had it written on their arms because that's what the computers gave them to advance out of sectional. And then it just kept – it just hovered around that below 1%, I think it was throughout that entire run to GameBridge. And they just kept proving people wrong and, and proving people wrong. And, you know, it's – they're just – they're a good team. They're a solid team. They're really, really well coached. They're very hard-nosed. You know, people were curious, I guess, to see how they looked this year without the Smith Twins there. What would that change about their identity? And not a ton. They, they're they still – they're still as hard-nosed as ever blue-collar team. They're really good defensively. Uh, yeah. And, 
again, I mean, they're right up there with top four chance to win it, maybe even top two. Yeah, I mean, they they definitely can win it. I mean, they're seven and two in their last nine games, so they're playing very well. And their only losses are a three point loss to HSC and OT, and they lost by six to LN. I mean, that's a two possession game. So, uh, like you said, any of these teams, you know, uh, uh, can win. There's no there's no doubt. Well, Courtney talked about the mental toughness, and when talking about Fishers, you also have to talk about the physical toughness. I mean, they're going to try to rough some people up, and they're going to they're going to try to rough Reagan up. They're going to try to rough Tipner up. They're, I mean, if they if they advance to to play like a southeastern, they're going to try to rough Makaleski up. Um, and they have kids that can do it. Like Shoy's a tough kid. I mean, we talked about it when HSC um, played Fishers in the Mud Sox game. Two of the biggest plays in that game were like often tough like rough and tumble tough offensive rebounds by Allison Choi, which led to, to like, I think kick out threes. Um, you know, Joe buckets is a, is a, is a tough kid. That's a, a, just a very physical guard. Nevaeh Dickman, Kate Thomas. I mean, these are, these are physically tough kids. That's very difficult to move off of their spot. And maybe Hank, one of the reasons why they've had such success in this sectional is because it is a tougher brand of basketball in the postseason. It's not, let's see who can get to 72, 73 points or something like that. It, it is kind of a ground and pounds kind of um, kind of atmosphere. So I think Fishers is going to be, it, it's a different team that can, that, that they're measured against, but you know, the history of this too, like they got, I think it was 14 fourth quarter points from Tamia Perriman to end Sydney Parrish's career in the same sectional, like, they have kids the the kid that can do that is Talia Harris. Like she, pro- she has proven it time and time again. And she is super capable of being the best player on the floor in a given night, or maybe even just a given quarter that can separate them and, and, and move forward. But I think collectively, before we throw it back to you guys and get kind of final thoughts on, on Fishers and no, like Nobles was won 80 games. Okay. And I use them as an example, like these teams win. Okay. There's no like two and 14 team here. Like, I mean, even Carmel is a 500 outfit and Westfield's an above 500 team. But like when you win 80 games in your high school career as Reagan Wilson and Ava Shoemaker and that, in that graduating class, like, you know how to win basketball games. So it's going to come down to little runs. It's going to come down to momentum. It's going to come down to matchups and it'll come down to adjustments. And, and it likely just like every single year, it's going to come down to a special kid making a play maybe in the fourth quarter to end, to, to end or extend a season. Quick note, Jordan, Jordan Smith, Danny mentioned, I'm glad you did. I forgot about this, but I was at practice with them a week or so ago and she was out shooting around for the first time. Nothing, nothing super strenuous, but I bring that up because she did play against Lawrence North, the win against Lawrence North the other night. I'm not sure they didn't have the minutes listed, but she did get in there. She had a three pointer. So good to see that she's at least working her way back. She got banged up in the uh, HSE game. So good to see that Jordan's back and playing. And, and like you said, Danny with Talia, just following up on that point, she had their, Talking to Vota, she pointed to that game that she had in sectional or sophomore year at Westfield as kind of her statement, I've arrived game. And I think back to just last year is her kind of being that unsung hero with the Smith Twins last year of just getting them the state championship game sticks out really big time. She was unbelievable there in the sectional too. I think it was in the sectional championship game. She was she was phenomenal alongside Haley Smith. But she has that big game experience. And that's the thing with Fishers too and I, all the teams in this group, honestly, is just that big game experience that they have from having played in these spots before – for a lot of them having played deeper into the postseason. Um, so that sort of stuff matters too. Courtney, I'll let you wrap us up before I throw everybody on the spot with a big question. Absolutely. I tell uh, all the girls that I train that there's no better time to be a girls basketball player than right now. Like the trajectory is going up. So my my final to close it out is head out to sectional eight, mental toughness sectional, get your kids out there and take them to go watch it. Like it is going to be fun basketball all next week starting Tuesday and then the Friday and Saturday, and it's going to be really, really fun. And all those, a couple other games around the state that are going on as well, a lot of those will probably be matchups on Saturday and championship games. So get out, take your family, take your kids, clear your schedule with next week and make it a priority to get out to these games and watch some really good basketball. Amen. All right, I'm, I'm going to put everybody on the spot here and ask for your uh, 4A North champion. I will not be participating, but I'd like to make everybody else uncomfortable. So, Josh, I'll let you lead us off, and Danny and Courtney. All right, listen, we started off as a Columbia City podcast. 
I had to give a deep, heartfelt apology. I did not know uh, that much about Columbia City before the season uh, started. And I am not going to uh, change my opinion on uh, Columbia City. I think they've been the number one team wire to wire. Uh, I think they're very deep. They've got a lot of really good players. And I see them uh, coming out on top on the north. Danny? Um, well, I pretty much hate you for this. Um, I'd like to point that out first. I'm going to take the, the history, okay, which is – a Hamilton County sectional champ making it to Gainbridge in the north. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say it's going to become five of seven years, which means that I've got to pick a sectional eight champ. Now I, I I'll go with HSE. And the reason why is because my Macaluski to me has put together as good of a singular season as I've seen in a very long time by anybody. And in a tight basketball game, I'm going to take that. I, I want the best player on the floor, um, whether it's uh, whether it's a uh, uh, clutch free throw. She's 86 percent foul. Shooter, whether it's a clutch free throw late. You know, Josh posed the question, can they get a basket and dead ball change of possession? They've run some pin down stuff for her. They're starting to, to get there. And I think with the lineup change, with putting Ant Green and Holman in the in the game at the same time, I do think that they're going to be able to guard enough to get through this sectional. And I'll take the historical significance, and I think it's going to be five of seven. I'll go with the Royals to represent the North. Courtney? I'm following in Danny's footsteps. Oh, um, Danny's territory. Here's the reason why. I Here. agree. I hate you for this question, Hank. Thank but you. But the reason I'm going with is because Cats out of the back. I've been working with that team for the last couple of weeks on their mindset stuff. So, like – that's the team I have the the heart connection with. I know take the bias out of it, but like when I'm locked in with those girls' eyes and I know what's going on inside there and and being able to challenge KK to start talking more and to be a leader, like that girl's a dog and they need her around there. I'm gonna I gotta I got I gotta go with HSE because I know that they're taking care of their mind and that can take them pretty far. I'm surprised nobody went with South Bend Washington or even gave them a mention. They're my sleeper. Sorry, about yeah. Washington. Yeah, no, same. I mean, Danny, just to go along, I'll do what you do and I'll elongate the podcast, but that's something that we talked about just a few weeks ago and them yeah. kind of being under the radar, so to speak, because it felt like at least they didn't have as much social media presence, but they just kept winning, just kept rolling along and winning. And I mean, on paper, they're stacked. The schedule is okay, but I mean, they're stacked. They're so talented. Yeah. They're going to breeze through that sectional. They should at least. Yep. And then you get in. They should win regional too. Yeah. yeah. They should win regional. Uh, like you said, Hank, though, I think it's just really with them, it's just really about health. And it's about like, you know, the draw, obviously, but you know, and they've they've had so much time off. Like, I don't know. I just I just I'm hoping that they, they are sharp. I think that would be my biggest concern going into the Well, tournament. we skipped over that sectional. So let me let me put two sentences together about South Bend, Washington. I say two, it's gonna turn into two, seven. Two. You but, got two, and then Courtney's gonna cut you off. But South but South Bend Washington, like that's one. Mar Marcy Reynolds, okay, she was asking around like a lot of different people in the basketball circles, like, you know, how does Jokic get the ball at the top of the key and how does he play point forward? Like they were studying the way basketball is played now. And I went back and watched South Bend Washington games just to kind of familiarize myself because we didn't get to see him at Sneakers for Santa with Kira Reynolds. Boy, they do that. Like she plays a ton of point forward for him. They throw outlet passes to her. They run sets like out of horn sets where they'll throw the ball to the elbow and then dive Kira Reynolds into in, into a post. She's a matchup problem. Now they have rim protection also for great on-ball defense that Raya Wilson provides. They're going to be tough with her because of her versatility and what she does to change that team. Kira Reynolds is real. And at some point in time, someone from Section 8 or somebody's going to run into them and be like, what is this? Like, this is Jokic. Like, this is crazy. So – Eight sentences. A lot of run-ons. Okay, I he's yeah. a little liberal with his comedy. I took there. the punctuation out. Just one run-on sentence. That's right. I like it. All right. Well, I got nothing else to extend the show. Plus, we have to do another one of these, another hour-long pod where we break down the South Regional. I promise we haven't forgotten about you. Uh, this isn't any any sort of bias or anything like that. If anything, it's the other way around because we're trying to get everybody as much airtime as we can. So we thank you all so much for watching, listening, and we'll be back with you uh, in a few hours.